You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Maram Namazi. And I'm Fadi Borspuya. Before we begin our program, we want to wish our viewers a wonderful, happy Noruz, Iranian New Year. We hope you enjoy Tarshan Basuri. And we wanted to have a drink in your, for your health. Yes, and have a prosperous New Year. Um, mm. While this is going down nicely, um, I should tell you that, that in this week's program, we interview Johan Harry on war on drugs. We'll also be talking about an undercover film on the situation of women in Raqqa, Syria, the continued attack against refugees and migrants, a fatwa on buffet, um, gender segregation at a London university, as well as running free. Stay with us. In the week that passed, there was a video that was taken by two women undercover in Raqqa, Syria. And it shows the situation of people living there to begin with, but also particularly the horrendous situation of women. It's nothing surprising uh, because we know what Islamic rules mean for women. But this is taken to the extreme. Yeah, and that, that's effectively life under fascism. Yeah. And that's, that's the ultimate form of fascism that there could be, and that's the religious autocracy to, to its ultimate form. And it's, um, although everybody recognizes this is ISIS, but when you actually see the situation and restriction, it gives a different dimension. And life yeah. under ISIS is really, really hard, and women actually do not exist. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it is really heartbreaking when you see the video, especially you know the way women have to wear actually two three layers of face veils as well and uh, they're constantly um, harassed if a driver for example picks up a woman he'll be flogged on her own women can't go to school they can't work they can't go anywhere without either another woman com companion or a male guardian yeah and that, that's unfortunately um, not many people recognize um, that the consequence of uh, the um, religious sort of government and religious sort of groups coming to power, and that, that's the effect of it when you look at it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you do see a lot of similarities with the situation of women elsewhere, like in Iran and so on and so forth. Obviously, there are differences, clearly, uh, because of the fight back and push back that's in right. a place like Iran as well, yeah. that the regime is not able to do uh, what it's doing. And obviously that does to some level exist in even under ISIS held territory. The fact that these two women at great risk to their lives are taking undercover video footage. I think, you know, hats off to them really. It's amazing uh, courage. But I just wanted to talk about, you know, uh, one of the women was saying, I long to take off the niqab and the darkness that cloaks us all and to go out into the street without being scared. And I want to live the way I want, go out alone and free without having a guardian with me. And in the end, she says, nothing matters more than freedom. And it's just really heartbreaking. It's so po poignant. Um, and especially when you think about a lot of things that are happening here in Europe and Britain with people defending Islamist norms and values. The London School of Economics, the Islamic Society there had a dinner, annual dinner, which had a curtain in between it. They sold separate tickets for brothers and uh, sisters. They had a curtain segregating men and women. And of course, you've got the National Union of Students saying nothing illegal happened, it was fine. And you've got the head of the student union at LSE going there and saying it was lovely. And you've got even ex-Muslims saying, well, you know, it's soft gender segregation, so it's not really discrimination because it's culture. I think um, we need to recognize that the Islamist group um, in like any other political group, I suppose they try to normalize um, the bits of the reality or the reality that is very harsh, try to normalize it and repackage it for the situation in 
Britain. They don't have enough political power, so they are effectively on the margins of political power. And that's how they, they function. They try to sort of repackage exactly the same policies that ISIS, Saudi Arabia and Iran have and adapt it to the current situation and the level of power they have. So they'll talk about rights and choice and women's agency and blah, 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 blah. And, and, and the power and influence and how much of the program or the plan they implement depends on how much the society allows. Hence, mm. fight back and restrictions are important. Mm. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think another really good example of this is the limits on free expression at universities. You know, we're, we're seeing a, a lot of that. And the restrictions are always for people like ourselves who are critics of Islam, critics of Islamism. And it seems that it's never really applicable to the Islamists. Yeah, and is, I think part and parcel of this situation or the factor here are the leadership of the National Union of Students, which is influenced by the uh, some people call them regressive left or pro-Islamist left or anti-colonial sort of heritage that they think the other or the supposedly the minority are right irrespective. They're very happy to sit next to uh, cage prisoners sort of leadership who support Taliban, who, you know, they, they fail to condemn stoning. They're happy to sit down and actually create a space for them to be able to um, um, argue the case. But when it comes to people to like, like yourself, uh, Mariam, um, it's they, suddenly there's a lot of restrictions. Um, and you'll see they, they are very reluctant to create a space for people who are very critical um, to speak. Yeah, we had a really great protest against uh, the leadership of the National Union students calling for reform of their no platform policies, which is restricting free expression. And, uh, you know, this is an issue that's been highlighted greatly. I think it is key to look at this as the Islamist political project, as you mentioned. Maryam Ahele Lucas, the Algerian sociologist, has written extensively on this, that they're using rights language, but if you don't recognize that the gender segregation, the restrictions on universities, is part of a political struggle that helps to increase their influence and power, you're missing the point. Now, with all these restrictions that women, men, children, people are facing in the Middle East, in North Africa and elsewhere, of course, you've got this widespread flight, this mass flight, unprecedented flight, people fleeing, trying to live free, and they're faced with increasing restrictions. Uh, NATO's getting involved. The European governments are now paying Turkey to take back refugees. They're trying to send people back to Libya. There's the, the the, um, the coalition government of Libya is not even in Libya, it's in Tunisia. They can't even be in Libya, but the refugees need to go back. It's very really interesting, you know, how much um, actually the European uh, Union and Commission are selling out the fundamentals of human rights and the right, fundamental human beings, the, the rights of human beings. Actually, they're selling out those rights to the Turkish government that we know about the record of that government. Yeah, is. it's ca killing, Just, killing uh, Kurds. Uh, arresting people, denying people the right to free expression, denying basic human rights, and refugees who are fleeing are being sent back there. And this is not going to end well because this, this policy needs to be defend, defeated mm. and the fundamental rights of people to free movement mm. needs to be guaranteed somehow. Yeah. Look, it's, uh, and, and I think the reality is that oftentimes people calling for open borders are considered naive, irrational, yada, yada, yada. Listen. When you defend human rights, it cannot be naive, it cannot be irrational. It is understanding that people, even if they don't look like you, even if they don't have the same passport as you, they are first and foremost human beings and they deserve, they deserve to live free and to live in a safe environment. I recently interviewed the journalist Johan Hari on his new book on the war on drugs. This is a hugely important interview and book. You don't want to miss it. Stay with us. Johan Hari, thank you for joining us on the program. I wanted to ask about your best-selling book, Chasing the Scream, on the drug war. What are some of the main myths that you deal with in the book? Can I just say before we start, just two things um, might be of interest to your viewers. One is uh, I wanted to say that I think we've known each other, for, Mariam, for about 15 years now. And I just want to say that you are one of the most brave and principled people I know. 
that I have seen you keep your cool when standing up to both kind of really frightening religious fundamentalists and right wingers here in Europe, and you always do it with such principle. And I've always been just so not. We, we spoke alongside each other at the many times, but I remember yeah. one time in particular when the Pope came to London and we spoke outside Downing Street, and it was I have this surreal memory of being sandwiched between you and Richard Dawkins and Ben Goldacre throwing condoms into the crowd that had been blown up and then. But yeah, so I, I just oh, want to... Oh, thank you. That's so kind of you. No, I, you. I really mean that. I think the work you do is so important and, and really so principled. Also, some of your viewers might remember my mum and dad. My parents um, worked in the Tehran Sheraton for three years. Between 1973 and 1976, my mother was the barmaid and my dad was a uh, cook in the kitchen. No. So they remember Iran really well, that my brother grew up for three years of his life there when he was uh, young, he remembers it, and um, they have really strong, really fond memories of it. They loved the Iranian people, they they loved it. So if anyone remembers my mum and dad, email me, they'd love to hear from their old Iranian <laughs> oh, friends. that's fantastic, that's yeah. fantastic. Um, so yeah, but, sorry, a long funny to your question, which is um, about the, the, the war on drugs. So I was interested in this for a very personal reason. One of my earliest memories is of trying to wake up one of my relatives and not being able to, and I, I didn't... I was very young then, so I didn't understand why, but as I got older, I realised we had drug addiction in my family. And when I started working on the book, it must be ne nearly five years ago, I'm terrible at maths, about five years ago, I realised we were coming up to, it's a hundred years since drugs were first banned last year. It was first banned by the United States and then imposed on the rest of the world. Um, and I realised, you know, I wanted to write a book coming out around the anniversary, and when I started to write, I kind of slightly arrogantly thought, oh, I know loads about this subject, you know, the, um, I've, uh, you know, I've lived through it with my family, I've written about it quite a lot as a journalist. But when I actually sat down, I realised that I didn't know the answers to the most basic questions about this. Why did we go to war against drug users and drug addicts? Why do we carry on when it doesn't seem to be working? Um, what are the alternatives actually like in practice? And what really causes drug use and drug addiction? And I couldn't find the answers in what I was reading, so I ended up going on quite a long journey. I went to 12 different countries, over 30,000 miles. What I wanted to do was sit with people whose lives had been changed, either by the war on drugs or by the alternatives to the war on drugs. And I think the main thing I realised is that almost everything we think we know about this subject is wrong. Drugs are not what we think they are. Addiction is not what we think it is. The drug war is not what we think it is, and the alternative to the drug war is not what we think it is. This actually plays out in Iran in really interesting ways that I'm, that I'm fascinated by. Obviously, it plays out everywhere. I think it particularly plays out in a fascinating way in Iran. But the, I'll just give you one myth to start with. I'm sure there's plenty we can, we can talk about. But one of the things that most blew my mind was to learn that addiction is not what we've been told it is. And if you had said to me five years ago, what causes, say, to pick an issue very relevant to Iran, heroin addiction? I think I would have looked at you like you were a bit stupid and I would have said, well, it's called heroin addiction. Obviously, heroin addiction is caused by heroin. We've got a story that we think, you know, if the next 20 people to walk past your offices, if they all used heroin together, if we plucked them randomly off the street and they all used heroin together for a month, at the end of that month, they'd all be heroin addicts for a simple reason, that there are chemical hooks in heroin that their bodies would start to physically need. And by the end of that month, they'd have this desperate physical craving. And that's what addiction is. That's what I believed. First thing that led to me to the fact there's something wrong about that is when it was explained to me, and if either of us step out onto the street now and we get hit by a truck, God forbid, and we get, I can imagine there's plenty of people driving trucks that want to run you over, <laughs> and me too, um, the, and we get taken to hospital with a broken hip, uh, we'll be given loads of diamorphine for the pain. Diamorphine is heroin. It's just the medical name for heroin, right? Well, you'd be given it for quite a long period of time. Anyone watching this who has a grandmother who's had a hip replacement operation, she's taken lots of heroin, right? If what we think about addiction is right, that it's caused by exposure to the chemical hooks, what should happen to all these people in hospitals? Some of them, at least, should be leaving as drug addicts. It doesn't happen. And when I learned that, it just seemed so weird and so contrary to everything I'd ever been told that I assumed it couldn't be right. I only really began to understand it when I went to Vancouver and inter interviewed this incredible man called Bruce Alexander. He's a leading professor of psychology there, now retired, who did an experiment that I think helps us to understand this. I think it particularly helps us to understand why Iran is having a big addiction crisis at the moment. 
He explained to me this idea about addiction that we've got in our heads that it's caused by the chemical hooks comes partly from a series of experiments that were done earlier in the 20th century. They're, they're really simple experiments and your viewers can try them at home if they feel a little bit sadistic. You get a rat and you put it in a cage and you give it two water bottles. One is just water and the other is water laced with either heroin or cocaine. If you do that, the rat will almost always prefer the drugged water and almost always kill itself quite quickly within about a week. So there you go, that fit, totally fits with what we think addiction is. In the 70s, Professor Alexander came along and said, hang on a minute, we're putting this rat in an empty cage. It's got nothing to do alone. It's got nothing to do except use these drugs. What would happen if we did this differently? So he built a cage that he called Rat Park, which is basically like heaven for rats, right? Anything a rat could want in life, it's got in Rat Park. It's got loads of cheese, it's got loads of friends, can have loads of sex, it's got loads of tunnels, everything rats like. And they've got both the water bottles, the, the normal water and the drugged water. But this is the fascinating thing. They try both, of course, because they don't know what's in them. In Rat Park, they don't like the drugged water. They almost never use it. None of them ever use it compulsively. None of them ever overdose. So you go from almost 100% overdose when they're isolated, have no meaning, are deprived of the things that give them meaning. And when they have good environments with good sources of meaning, you, you, you have no compulsive use and no overdose. I think it tells, and there's loads of human examples I can talk about, but I think it tells you something really fundamental. So the fundamentally drug addiction is a social problem? Yeah, I think the opposite of addiction isn't sobriety, the opposite of addiction is connection. There is a real, there is a real chemical hook component, that, that, that's not a fake part of the story, but it's a small part of the story. Um, the, the, as you can tell from the fact that you have things like gambling addiction, well, obviously there's no chemical hook in, in a roulette wheel, right? And yet you go and meet a gambling addict, they're just as addicted as any alcoholic or, or drug addict you're ever going to meet. Um, I think you're right that the social and environmental factors are huge and have been massively underestimated. So is that why the war on drugs is failing? Is that, or that's one of the reasons, what are the other ones? I think it's a key reason. Um, because once you understand that pain and isolation are major drivers of addiction, you realise why inflicting more pain and more isolation on addicts doesn't work. In fact, it's worse than that it doesn't work. It actually makes the problem worse. I'll give you an example. In, I wanted to go to the places where they had been really tough in the drug war and places where they'd adopted really compassionate drug policies. So I'll give you uh, two examples. In Arizona, I went out on a group of women, with a group of women, who are made to go out on a chain gang wearing t-shirts saying I was a drug addict and forced to dig graves while members of the public jeer at them. And then they go back to the prison which is uh, tents surrounded by barbed wire in the desert. Those women, when they leave, almost all of them go back to drug addiction. They feel even more humiliated. These are broken women. You know, you talk to them about their lives. They, they, you know, these are just broken people. And this system breaks them more. At one point in that prison, I asked to... The, the, the women were terrified of this thing called the hole, which is the solitary confinement block. And I asked to, to see the hole. And I was really surprised that the guards took me. Took me to see the hole. And the women were... It was just a kind of airless cell, kind of, I mean, it was literally air, but, you know, it was just a cell where the woman is put alone with nothing for a month. And I looked at this and I suddenly thought, this is the closest you could ever get to a human recreation of the cages that guaranteed addiction in rats. Mm. And this is what we're doing, make, thinking it'll make these women stop being addicted. It was crazy. So there's, there's, you can see it there, but if you look at a place that went completely beyond the war on drugs in a really interesting way, um, which I think helps us to understand it as well. So in the year 2000, Portugal had one of the biggest drug problems in the world, actually even bigger than the one in Iran at the moment. 1% of the population was addicted to heroin, which is extraordinary. And every year they tried the Iranian stroke American way more, they arrested more people, they imprisoned more people, and every year the problem got worse. And one day, the Prime Minister and the leader of the opposition got together and basically said, look, we can't, can't go on like this, what are we going to do? So they decided, they decided to set up a panel of scientists and doctors and they said to them, you guys go away, look at the best evidence about addiction, including what we've just been talking about, come back and tell us what will solve it and we've agreed in advance we'll do whatever you recommend. So just took it out of politics in a really smart way. 
I don't think they thought the panel would recommend something quite as radical as they did. But anyway, the panel came back, led by this amazing man called Dr. Hua Goulart, who I got to know. And they said, decriminalise all drugs, from cannabis to crack. But, and this is the crucial next step, take all the money we currently spend on making addicts' lives worse and spend it instead on turning their lives around. And what's interesting is that money, and that they did it, it, it wasn't... It's not really what we think of as drug treatment in Britain and the US. So they did some rehab, some uh, psychological support. But actually the biggest thing they did is the opposite of what we do. They set up a huge program of job creation for addicts. Uh, say you used to be a mechanic, they'll go to a garage and they'll say, employ this guy for a year, we'll pay half his wages. They set up a huge program of micro loans so addicts could set up small businesses they ran themselves. The, the goal was to say to every addict in Portugal, we love you, we value you, we're on your side, we want you back. And the results are now in, it's 15 years and a few months since this, this began. Injecting drug use is down in Portugal by 50%, 5-0%. Overdose deaths are massively down. HIV infection is massively down. Wow. You know, I went and interviewed a guy called Juan Figuera, who was the top drug cop in Portugal at the time of the decriminalisation. And he led the campaign against it. He said, this is madness. This will, you, I mean, you can imagine the things people said. The country will be taken over by drugs. Everyone will, become a, you know, will have a huge increase in drug use and drug addiction. And he said to me, everything I said would happen didn't happen and everything the other side said would happen did. And he talks about how he felt really ashamed that he'd spent 30 years before the decriminalization arresting and harassing drug addicts when he could have been turning their lives around. So, I mean, it, it's really heartbreaking when you think about the sorts of abuses that drug uh, addicts uh, face. In Iran, for example, it, you can even be executed for it. There was recently information about a village where the entire male population had been ex uh, executed because of drug issues. You know, so obviously that's not the way forward. What are some of the minimum steps that governments need to take to get rid of this problem? Well, I think it's interesting, just to come to that in a second, but I think what you've touched on a really interesting aspect of this, which is that, so Iran is fairly widely regarded in the kind of academic literature as having one of the worst addiction crises in the world. The US is one of the other places, Russia, US and Iran are usually kind of top of the uh, dystopian league tables of, of drug addiction. And um, I think it tells you something because, you know, drug addiction is a measure of misery and people having thwarted lives and people finding it un unbearable to be present in their lives. If you think about it this way, and it's hard, it took me a while to get my head around these ideas as well. If you think about it, one way I think about it is, you know, before we came in, you had a cup of tea and I had a can of Diet Coke. We could have drunk vodka before we did this interview, right? Totally legally, there's a shop just across the street that sells vodka. I could have brought in a bottle of vodka, we could, have, we could be drinking it now. We're not. The reason why we're not is not because anyone's stopping us. The reason we're not doing that is because we, we want to be present in our lives. You know, we've got things we want to do, we've got things we believe in, we've got, you know, things we, we want to be present for. The core of addiction is about not wanting to be present in your life. And when you have huge numbers of people in your society who do not want to be present in their lives, that tells you something that things has gone terribly wrong in that society. Now, you don't... You definitely don't need me to tell you about what's going wrong in Iran that I think it's obvious to everyone who'd, who'd, be, who'd be listening to this. There's also a parallel horrendous addiction crisis in the United States. You know, for the first time in the history of the United States, average male life expectancy among white men has fallen. Literally for the first time since the inception of the country, overwhelmingly because of addiction and suicide. Um, uh, again, I think it's a sign that there's something terribly wrong with that society and that culture as long as, as well as, as with Iran, a lot of things that they do right and a lot of admirable aspects to both societies as well. So I think it really tells you something. Um, in terms of... Um, so is it decriminalisation as the first step, basically? Well, so there's an interesting debate. So what we've talked about is the harm that's caused to drug addicts, right, and drug users, who are different categories. The vast majority of drug users are not addicts. The vast majority of drug users, just like the vast majority of people who drink alcohol, are not alcoholics, right? So most people who use currently illegal drugs, including cocaine and heroin, and that surprised me when I looked at the figures, but they're very clear, um, are not addicts. They're doing it for the same reason that, you know, um, you know, a lot of my friends would have a glass of wine or, or a glass of vodka. Um, but, so we've, we've talked about that. I actually think the biggest harm caused by the war on drugs is not, obviously it's very close to my heart, I think it's horrendous. The biggest harm is a whole other thing, 
which is the violence caused by the system of prohibition. Again, this plays out in Iran in very significant ways. So the best way to explain it is, when you ban a drug, obviously it doesn't banish, right? It's transferred from the people who used to control it, doctors, pharmacists, legal businesses, to armed criminal gangs. And that has a real effect. best way to understand the effect is, if you imagine, if you or I now, maybe I've depressed you so much, we decide to go and steal a bottle of vodka from the uh, liquor store across the street, the off-license across the street. If that store catches us, they'll call the police, and the police will come and take us away. <clears throat> So that liquor store doesn't need to be violent, it doesn't need to be intimidating. They've got the power of the law to uphold their property rights. If, on the other hand, we decided to steal a bag of cannabis or a bag of cocaine from the people who sell it in this area, and <laughs> they sell it in this area like they do in every part of London and every part of the world, um, the guy, if that guy catches us, obviously he can't ring the police, right? The police will come and take him away. He'd have to fight us. Now, if you're a drug dealer, you don't want to be having... You don't want to be fighting all the time, right? So you have to establish a reputation for being so frightening that people won't be so foolish as to come and pick a fight with you. You have to establish your place in that neighbourhood by fighting off other drug dealers. The war on drugs creates a war for drugs with a huge amount of violence. Milton Friedman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, calculated there are 10,000 additional murders every year in the United States as a result of that. Now I learned a lot of this from spending a lot of time with a transgender crack dealer in Brooklyn called Chino Hardin, who I write about in Chasing the Scream, and with a hitman for the, one of the deadliest Mexican drug cartels, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But the, the, so that's bad enough in a place like London. <clears throat> if you're on the supply route countries, where you know, huge chunks of the economy are therefore taken over by armed criminal gangs, <clears throat> you, you're talking about a devastating amount of violence. I spent time in northern Mexico. I just came here from Colombia. Um, you know, more people have died in the drug war violence in Mexico and Colombia than have died in Syria in the civil war, right? You compare how much we talk about Syria, quite rightly, we should talk about Syria and we should do what we can, but we almost never talk about the drug war related violence. And that violence is entirely caused by prohibition. And if you want to know proof of that, ask yourself, where are the violent alcohol dealers? You know, does the head of Guinness go and shoot the head of Smirnoff, right? Do the, the kids who work in the local supermarket in the liquor aisle, do they go and stab the people who work in the off-license? Of course not. That happened under alcohol prohibition. We all know who Al Capone was, right? That exactly happened. That violence ended the day alcohol prohibition ended because it was transferred from a prohibited market to a... To, so I think the case you, you referenced, I, I'd want to go and look it up again, but the case you referenced of the Iranian village where there was the massacre and there have been a whole series of massacres in Iran and other parts of the, the region. Um, uh, and my understanding is I think that's a village that was associated with drug trafficking rather than drug addiction. And, um, and again, there's, sometimes you get a kind of, um, you know, attitude which is, oh well, you know, we'll have some sympathy for the addicts, but people involved in the trade, they deserve their killing, they deserve the horror they're getting. And it's a less popular cause. Actually, you know, if I think about Chino, the, the crack dealer I, know, I got to know in Brooklyn, if I think about Rosalio, who was a hitman for the Mexican, for the Zetas, which is one of the worst Mexican drug cartels, they didn't deserve to die. You know, they were born in awful circumstances, they had awful lives, which doesn't, uh, I don't condone the acts of violence that they committed, particularly Rosalio, but, um, you know, and I think, it, it, so, this, this, this kind of mad logic, and Iran is one of the worst offenders in the world for, you know, extreme human rights violations against anyone suspected of being involved in the drug trade. Um, I think we're a disaster. There's actually a terrible case. Um, I'm going to say their names wrong. You've told me how to say it. Alay, Alay. Yeah, the Alayi brothers. So, uh, obviously, uh, from the, uh, um, the kind of Khomeini revolution in 1979, or the hijacked revolu revolution hijacked by Khomeini in 1979, to the, the late 90s, Iran has these very brutal drug policies, somewhat analogous to what Russia has now, where basically anyone who um, has a... Um, anyone who's found with drugs in any way is horrifically abused. And one of the effects when you do that... So this intersects with the AIDS crisis in a really disastrous way, um, which is that if, um, if you arrest people who are found with needles, for example, um, which was done in Iran, which is done now in Russia, which was done in the United States briefly at the, during the, age crisis, the height of the AIDS crisis there. What it, what it means is 
addicts don't want to carry needles, so they'll share needles. Now, if you want to spread AIDS, that's what you'd do, right? You would, you would punish people who found with needles because then they'll have to share them and then the virus is supersized, is um, metastasized, right? I interviewed a guy called Eric Sterling who was the, um, wrote the drug laws for the United States in the, in the 80s. He was the lawyer on the uh, House subcommittee who, who they turned what the, law, what the uh, senators and congressmen would want to happen into actual the wording of the law. And he remembered a time, I may be getting some of the details wrong, but he remembered a time when at the height of the AIDS crisis, um, you know, uh, health advisors would come in and say basically what I just said, and some of the people there would be like, well, do we want them to live? I mean, good, we'll get rid of them all. You know, uh, and I think there was a similar attitude in, in Iran. There's certainly a similar attitude in Russia at the moment, where the, the Russian drugs are Viktor Ivanov. is a complete maniac. But in the 90s, the late 90s, because of course, even if you have a completely annihilationist view towards drug use, as we want them all to die, you can't contain an HIV crisis within, among drug users. Drug users have sex with other people, they, you know, they have children and all sorts of other things. So at that point in the, in the, the late 90s, and of course the slight, you know, the sl very slight opening of the reformists at the time, you had a movement towards harm reduction. Late in the day, but it happened, these extraordinary brothers that we're talking about, both doctors, they led a harm reduction program really bravely, it massively reduced the, um, the HIV transmission in Iran. There will be people watching this program who are alive now because of that program. And then during the crushing of the Green Revolution and the catastrophe surrounding that, um, they were arrested and they were forced into exile. They're now in, uh, I think, believe in upstate New York. And uh, harm reduction has been disrupted. It's not been entirely shut down in Iran, but it's been disrupted. Uh, that has catastrophic consequences, of course, for the people of, of Iran. Mm. So you, you mentioned there's a UN meeting that happens every 10 years. What are some of the things that you're hoping would come out of this meeting that would help people in Iran, in Russia, in the US and elsewhere? This is going to be a really exciting and important moment. So basically, once every 10 years, the UN has a kind of big drug war jamboree. It's called the UNGAS, the UN um, General Assembly Special Session. And it's a bit like the climate talks, but full of awful people. <laughs> and um, the, it's happening two years early because Colombia and Mexico and Guatemala asked for it to happen early. And um, <clears throat> it's a, a really important moment because it's going to, so basically every time it's happened before, countries turn up and they go, yeah, we're going to rid the world of drugs. Their actual official slogan is, a drug free world, we can do it. Which I think tells you something about how removed from reality that is. I was speaking the other day to the the Czech drug minister, the, Czech, the drug minister for the Czech Republic, and he said, you know, to find slogans as crazy as that, you have to think about the communism I grew up under. You know, like, I mean, it's ludicrous, the idea that you could have a drug. There's it's never been a drug-free world, you know. <laughs> Good luck with that. Um, but this is going to be a really exciting moment because this is the first time when a significant number of countries are going to turn up and say, we're not doing this anymore. Enough. So it's an interesting mixture of countries. I've sp in the last... Uh, a couple of weeks I've spoken to the, uh, there must have been more than that, last month. Uh, in Colombia I met with an advisor to President Santos. They're, they're, going, to take a, in, they're going to take a really strong line. Uh, the Jamaican drugs minister, Mark Golding, who's a justice minister, I should say, who's an amazing man. Uh, the Czech drug minister, whose name I cannot pronounce, I'm not going to try. Um, port, looks like Portugal, Switzerland, uh, Uruguay, uh, um, and a few other places are going to just say no more. So on the one hand you've got this reform block. On the other hand, you've got this block of um, some of the worst regimes in the world, really. You've got uh, Russia, China, the Saudis, and Iran, who are going to say the exact opposite. We need to intensify the war on drugs. You've got in the middle, so it's funny because up to now, the United States has been the leader of that block, in a way. It's been the country that imposed this on the world. Now their own people have rebelled against it. Colorado and Washington have voted to legalise cannabis. They have, in fact, four states have now voted to legalise cannabis. It's happened in Colorado, Washington and Oregon. Um, I have a chapter in Chasing the Screen about the amazing people who led that, um, that movement. And so you're going to have um, the US in this weird position where they've normally been the ones beating everyone up, but they're turning up in breach of the, <clears throat> the drug war rules themselves. So it'll be a fascinating moment. And I think um, one of the demands of the reform bloc, which I think we might actually get, 
is it a change to the drug treaties, uh, or rather to set in train the change to drug treaties, thing, these things take ages, to say, at the very least, no one should be being executed for breaching the drug drug laws. So as you know much better than me, Iran has, uh, is it the highest or one of the highest? Highest, yeah, it's, it's in the yeah. top three yeah. or four, isn't it? Um, uh, for executions and, and drug ex drug related executions are extremely high on that. So I think we could get international condemnation of, I think there's, there's like six or seven countries that are holding out, Iran, Thailand just executed people, didn't they? There's, there's a few places that still execute people for drug related offenses. At the very least we should be getting that. But what will be important is no one will be able to say after this UN special meeting, oh, all the countries of the world are united, we're all behind this vision. You know, no one can say that anymore. And that is a really crucial thing to have. And loads of victims of the drug war will be turning up. It's some amazing people that I got to know in the writing of my book. So I think it's a super exciting moment. Also, the book is coming out in Farsi. I'm thrilled to say uh, later this year or early next year. It's being translated at the moment. I'm, um, I'm really thrilled about that as you know my family has this connection with Iran I, you know it's um, a country I've always been fascinated by and uh, and uh, you know uh, it's a country where arguments for reform are really desperately needed and I think the most important thing to communicate to people in Iran who are uh, supporting the current drug war is to say look the one thing you can say in defense of the war on drugs is it has been tried the United States has spent a trillion dollars they have killed hundreds of thousands of people, they have done it for a hundred years, and at the end of all that, they can't even keep drugs out of their prisons. Which gives you some idea of how effective that strategy is going to be. I have been to the places where they have tried decriminalisation and legalisation. I have been to Portugal, I have been to Switzerland. You know, Switzerland is a really conservative country, right? This is not, you know, the, actually the life my grandmother had, you know, growing up in a, a mountain, uh, on a mountain in Switzerland, in, was more like an Iranian woman's life than, than like the life of a woman here in London. Really conservative society. They decided to legalise heroin for addicts because the results were so striking. Do you know how many people have died of heroin overdoses on legal heroin in Switzerland? Nobody. Not a single person. So when people say, oh, the only answer to this drug crisis in Iran is war, 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 you know, look at the places that have tried that and look at the places that have done the exact opposite. You can choose which of them to be. I know it's, it's a fight in a very powerful and crucial fight, which you're a really important part of, to get to be in the position where you can be making the choices about the policies of the country and not a disgusting, unelected, reactionary clique of maniacs, but <laughs> you want to get there first. But, you know, once that's in place, which is a big once I know, you know, then, then you're really, you know, then, then you can choose policies that will save the lives of enormous numbers of Iranian citizens. Thank you very much. Ah, oh, thank you very much. I should just say that people can, uh, if anyone wants any more information about the book, or if they want to hear the interviews with any of the people that I've mentioned, if they go to www.chasingthescream, and that's scream as in ah, not scream as in screen, that you look at this program on, uh, you can go to www.chasingthescream.com and uh, facebook.com slash chasingthescream. Brilliant. Hooray. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary. Brilliant. Thanks. The insane fatwa of this week is from a Saudi cleric, Saleh al fawzan and he has issued a fatwa against, you might want to take a pen and paper out just to make sure you don't ever go there again, but it's against all-you-can-eat buffets. Hmm. This guy has something to do with anything that people enjoy. There's one opportunity that people have with the family to go and out and celebrate together and have some food in a restaurant, in all-you-can-eat, it's a no-no. Uh, he doesn't I, but, like but there's, there's, you know, there's a lot of reason and thought put behind it. So don't just laugh at it, you know, without knowing all the rationale behind it. Let's legitimize it, it, it says the yes. It says the value and quantity should be predetermined before its purchase. Whoever enters the buffet and eats for ten or fifty riyals, especially those sums, it's, there's a lot of thought behind it. Without deciding the quantity they will eat are violating Sharia law. You know what? Uh, it, re it reminds me of John <laughs> Pinnett, the late John Pinnett, who had a joke about sort of uh, buffet, <laughs> hit me can. again, all you can eat buffet. And I think this guy is crazy. <laughs> I mean, and he's part of and parcel of 
a group of fatwa givers sort of institution they're busy the institution in Saudi Arabia they got a lot of work out, to do <laughs> we're going to keep dishing out all these fatwas against people's enjoyment and people's rights well I mean you know that someone's written congratulations now even open buffets has made it on the list of things that are forbidden to us basically I think they're just go down the street they see something they're like oh, open buffet let's write yeah. about that oh woman let's write about that <laughs> it's crazy. it's Pathetic. Just that. The slice of life this week is from Sweden and it is two young women who've started a Welcome Stranger project. It's a sports project. They taught for first cross-country skiing and now they've got a running program for refugees and of course it's open to other residents in the area as well. And this is such a beautiful uh, project uh, despite all the you know right-wing propaganda against the refugees and the Im negative impact supposedly they have on society they've actually shown the a beautiful sort of moment that the society welcomes refugees and set them off on a, on a good start to be part and parcel of uh, society. Yeah, it's called Welcome Strangers. Isn't Hello, it? Strangers. Hello, Strangers. Yeah. Yeah. So, well done to um, Emma Arneson and, and Lundberg from Sweden who've created the moment of life, a slice of life for this week. Yeah, we appreciate that. Thank you. Well now, of course, uh, before we end our program, we want to remind everybody that it was New Year. Uh, we wish you again a Happy New Year. And it's important to remember that uh, the Iranian New Year uh, was is something that's pre-Islamic period, so a lot of Islamic regimes are not very happy with it being celebrated. <coughs> and we have every um, um, Wednesday before the well, last Wednesday of the year, people celebrate and they um, take part in street festivals and jump over fire as part of the celebrations. And every year the Islamic regime and his leadership try to ban this. I mean, this year Khomeini, Khomeini, Khomeini. himself said, you know, this is nothing Islamic in this and people shouldn't participate. Well, that's why they participate. And that's what happened. Everybody <laughs> came on the streets and started young people dancing and jumping over the fire. So before we go, we leave you with these beautiful scenes of street celebrations and parties against the Islamic regime in Iran. And we also should show some pictures of uh, people celebrating, uh, Kurds celebrating in Turkey, yes. even though the Turkish government has banned uh, Noru celebrations as well. So goodbye and enjoy these videos and photos. Goodbye. <laughs> شب 
به سوریز هم و از یادت ببر شادی های این شب و همه جا با خود ببر شب چار شب سوریز هم و از یادت ببر شادی های این شب و همه جا با خود ببر راستی تو نره راستی تو نره وقتی از آتش میپری واجه آزادی را به زبان ها بیاری آزادی 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 دستا را گره کنی از رو آتش میپری وقت پریدن از اون قند به لب ها بیاری صفا کنید از بحر نور و روشنی الهله ای بپا کنید خرمن آتش بساز شادی کن از روش بپر بحر رهایی از بلا سرخی شو با خود ببر Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary. And yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo-breaking, free-thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt and that's why the, you need to support us we are and the alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa of corruption and immorality so do support us here's a short video from patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week that's nothing support us patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators it's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or web comics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators. <laughs> 